um, let's begin. Uh, our topic today is safeguarding carers. It really began as safeguarding and carers, but you know, what I was really interested in is uh, the, air, the topic, the issues of carer harm, which is something that um, came up for me uh, in my own practice on a number of occasions, but it's also something that was kind of hard to sort of um, find um, guidance or research on, or even um, a lot of the guidance that we have available to us on safeguarding doesn't specifically um, address carers and their issues and is issues of carers harm. For example, if you read the, um, the uh, Pan London Safeguarding Guidance, it um, doesn't mention carers at all. And in some ways thinking about this, I began to realize that actually it's because in some ways carers don't really fit into the way we often think about um, uh, vulnerability or the way we think about um, uh, safe, safeguard, safeguarding risks. And um, so I want to unpack that today. Um, it's an interactive session. We will be having a breakout room with a case study. So that will give a chance because I know in this room, there's a lot of experience. A lot of people um, will have come across some of these issues in their own, in their own practice. Um, a lot of people will ha have brought, will have their own insights based on their, on, on their, on their experience. Um, on their knowledge, on, on their work. So I wanted to, to really have a chance to sort of like um, tap into some of the knowledge that people have here and tap into some of your expertise, which is why we're going to be having a breakout room and then we'll have a, um, a, a sort of moderated feedback session where we'll get a chance to share some of the things that come up for people in the breakout room. So, um, Without further ado, let me, um, let, let's get the show on the road. Um, so we're here to explore care or harm and how we can address it in practice. So the aims of the session are to introduce and contextualize uh, care or harm, to review some of the commonly held uh, concepts of harm and violence towards carers in the context of social care. Um, also then to, we want to really kind of try and locate this within our um, adult safeguarding um, models, within the policies and procedures. H how does it fit in? Um, then, um, and I think this is probably the, the main part body of the session, we want to have a chance to explore some of the ethical complexities and dilemmas that arise in our practice when we uh, come across issues of care or harm. And hopefully out of that, begin to develop um, uh, some strategies for intervention to think, um, to think about how it is we could react, how it is we can mitigate or uh, eliminate instances of care or harm when, when, it when we come across occurrences of it in practice. So let's begin with a definition so we're all on the same page. Care or harm is when carers experience violence or or become subject to controlling or coercive behavior, either on an incidental or on a systemic basis. This could be a one-off thing that happens, or it could be part of a, of a pattern um, uh, of behavior, of events that can maybe be going on for many years. So it could be incidental, it could be a, a systemic phenomena, but either way, it can result, it's something that results in physical, psychological, and or sexual harm. Uh, to, to, to the person concerned. And this is taken from Isam Bradbury Jones and Eusen, a paper that's just come out this year and published in the Journal of Social Work, um, British Journal of Social Work. And it actually is one of the few papers that um, actually addresses this issue. Um, so we'll be mentioning them again um, throughout this seminar, really. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing for a moment because I want to um, basically get a, a, a sort of a sense of um, uh, check in with the people in the room really. Um, can I just, Charles, can I ask, is it possible for us to run a poll? Okay, if we're not able to do the poll, then perhaps we could go straight, we'll go straight to the Mentimeter if that's okay. Yep, I think we will. 
Okay, so what I'm going to do, everybody, is um, basically it's uh, I'm going to um, put into the chats a link, which you're able to. Um, uh, let me just see. I have to send this message to everybody. Okay, this is a link to a polling tool called Mentimeter, and it's a word cloud. So it will allow, if you um, click on this link that I've just put in the chats, and you can use it to open a, um, it should op hopefully open another browser on your laptop or whatever device you're using. And there's a, quest a question there. And the question is, what comes to mind when you think about care or harm? Now I'm going to start sharing my screen so you can actually, I'll put the question in the chat too, as a prompt. Um, but if you just click on that link that I put in the chat, I'm just going to start sharing um, with you uh, my, my screen again. Um, so let me see, I just need to navigate to the right browser window. And I can see that two people have already voted. Let me come back to Zoom so I can share so you can see what's going on. Okay. Yeah, there we are. So now you're actually seeing uh, the web browser page. Now you need to click on the link that I shared with you in the chats uh, to find your way there. You'll get an option, you can put in three words. Um, how these things work is if people put in the same word, the word gets bigger, yeah? So if you see something there and you think, actually that's, you know, that's what I want to say, um, write it in again. It'll just, it'll make it bigger and more, and more obvious. And we've had 13 people vote already. And, um, but I'll give a few more moments. If for some reason you weren't able to link, to use the link, there is another way into this. It's a slightly longer way around, but you can go to www.menti.com and then you have to use an access code, which is written here at the top of the screen over the question. It's 4879192. So maybe, if it's not convenient for you to do this on your laptop and click the link, um, you could always, you know, if you've got a, a smartphone or some other device to hand, you could just use open a browser and go to www.menti.com and use that code and it'll get you to the same place. And then you can participate in the vote as 23 of us already have. Safinda, you've raised your hand. Yeah, we've we've got a question in the chat box and it says, does carer include both formal and informal carers? So when we're talking about carers. Excellent question. In what context? Yeah, and that's something I should have disambiguated, cleared up at the start. Um, we're very, very much looking at um, informal carers, at family carers here. Though some of the research actually does address issues of care or harm in institutional settings. And in fact, some of the really interesting research has com compared, especially working with around dementia, um, the experiences of formal carers and the kind of um, uh, challenging behavior they may encounter in residential care from people with dementia, comparing that to the experiences of family carers. And, and actually the meanings that people give are quite different. Um, formal carers um, will often put, um, accept higher levels of verbal abuse and um, uh, then um, accept might be the wrong word. Um, they're less offended by it. But then family carers, when their loved one is being abusive towards them, they tend to understand it in a very personal frame. And um, it can be actually much more hurtful and psych much more psychologically distressing over, over time. There's also interesting stuff work around um, formal carers comparing uh, incidents of, um, of uh, aggression towards formal carers in residential homes in Canada, the UK and in Scandinavia. And it's actually much less in some countries than in others. And that a lot is to do with practice, to do with how, mo how much the, the workforce, how many people are casual staff and how many are permanent trained members of staff. 
those factors do make a lot of difference to the kind of experiences. But here today, our main focus, and I've gone off on a tangent, uh, but our main focus to come back to it is family carers. So we've had 35 people vote, which is great. I'm going to do that thing where I'll start to talk and possibly things will things will just all shift behind me, but you, at some point we've got to kind of um, go in. But if you're still want to vote, please do. Um, so, okay, the main thing, uh, th word that I'm seeing there jumping out at me is, is, is abuse, yeah. Um, also, um, we're seeing, uh, <laughs> this is what happens. <laughs> as soon as you start talking, it moves. <laughs> Um, but abuse is pretty much ho holding up at the center at the center of the cloud. Ideas around vulnerability, emotional abuse, uh, physical harm, um, stress, violence. Uh, I think this is narcissistic behavior. Um, ideas around neglect. Now, this I wonder when people are talking about care, care harm, are they thinking about harm by carers or harm? two cares and actually the thing is human relationships are quite complicated sometimes there can be uh, multi-directional harm going on sometimes um, uh, people who are who are receiving care and support uh, who we might for shorthand in practice refer to as service users can be acting in ways that are harmful uh, to their carers but then carers can also be acting in ways that harm um harm the people that they're caring for and there is very much an idea in um in uh the literature around carers about um the concepts usually expressed as carers burden that the carers are under so much stress and demands that they may unintentionally reach some kind of breaking point where they then uh uh um do some harm to the person that they're looking after, yeah. Um, but there is also a phenomenon um, of of people who receive care and support being abusive towards their carers. And again, it's something that's very much, I think, um, I know it in my own practice. It came up a number of times. Um, I thinking about it I can think of four or five cases we, and we dealt with those under safeguarding um, though they didn't really fit with safeguarding I can think of one case that's coming to mind is um, uh, was an elderly gentleman who really didn't have any uh, social care needs in himself yeah who was a carer for his adult son who had a disability and a, uh, uh, a substance misuse problem involving um, uh, crack cocaine and basically he would his father gave him an allowance he would like demand money from his father and one point pushed his father down the stairs which led to the gp raising a safeguarding alert but actually the person who was the perpetrator had the most care and support needs um, um but that was dealt with under safeguarding um so you know i think it's there's a real uh blurring of boundaries sometimes in, in in this work who is actually the uh um sometimes people don't fall into neat boundaries between um a perpetrator and a victim sometimes the person who who may be seen as more vulnerable or have more vulnerabilities may be um the person who's actually creating um the harm and the and the risk so um there's a lot of things going on here. We're, we're seeing different types of abuse. We're seeing um, uh, different pressures on carers, such as being forced into, into a caring role. Uh, we're having physical harm, we're having emotional harm. The issue about intentionality, and I will come back to this later in the, in, in the session, but there is a lot about how we, how as social workers, as practitioners, the issue of intentionality becomes really important to, to us about in the way that we tend to respond to cases. And maybe we need to unpack that a little bit to think about, is that really how we should be, um, what we should be basing our responses to. So this is really useful um, for me to kind of get a 
a feeling for what's going on in the room. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to share slides again. Um, again, I'll just pause before I jump into the slides and ask, has any questions come up in the chats? Um, if I could ask my colleague. Uh, no, nothing else has come up in the chat. Right. Okay. Um, So I want to give a bit of context for um, for um, the experience or the phenomena of um, uh, harm towards family caregivers. There's in the literature there seems to be really the fields where there's the most research being done has been around uh, problematic substance misuse, and I think the um, in adult social care the sort of classic. Um, uh, um, presentation of this would be perhaps an older person who's got a son or daughter who has an addiction who's live who is living with them but the all um, the older person is basically keeping things together and um, uh, ensuring that like um, doing their best to maintain their 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 um, their, their, uh, their loved one's health and uh, safety but um, uh, but obviously, but the person's addiction is 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 create and and behaviors associated with that addiction. It's more the behaviors such as uh, stealing or such as um, uh, uncontrolled aggression that are um, that are basically presenting a risk. Um, there is quite a lot of literature on this around this, in the specialist areas of drugs, uh, drugs and alcohol teams. But actually, this this thing can come up anywhere. Yeah, um, it can come up anywhere in, in um, uh, adult social care. Um, similarly, there's there's some literature on mental health on mental health problems, uh, and there's some interesting research in that about the quality of people's relationships before um, uh, the the uh, onset of any of severe mental health issues. It seems that if the if the relationship wasn't good beforehand, the mental uh, then one uh, then the person who needs care is becoming increasingly ill. Things deteriorate, and things will come. Uh, things that may have been there before difficulties in the relationship, they kind of come to the fore again, um, or come or actually get amplified uh, by the exper experience of the mental health crisis. Um, a really big area is around dementia and cognitive impairments, and there's a lot of writing around this. Um, and it's as people, um, uh, uh, as they lose their cognitive abilities, um, they can become confused. In advanced stages, it can be um, uh, people um, uh, misunderstood standing uh, where they are, becoming confused about who they're with, people developing paranoias, uh, people um, uh, uh, beco uh, becoming angry. Um, this is an area where probably in adult social care, you're more, you're one of the more common areas that um, uh, you, may, you may encounter um, uh, issues of care or harm. Another area, and it's kind of overlapping, but it's not exactly the same, is um, intimate partner violence, uh, IPV, in older age. Um, a lot of, a lot of, in society in general, we often um, have views about um, older people um, that uh, um, perhaps that uh, their lives are somehow calmer. Perhaps they're more mature, perhaps they're, they've been in a relationship for a very long time. So uh, that kind of can sometimes blind people to um, incidents of, uh, of domestic violence, of intimate, intimate partner violence. And research that's been done um, has shown that with older age cohorts, the levels of domestic violence are the same as in younger ones. Um, uh, the same kinds of levels of, of uh, um, of either physical violence or coercive uh, controlling behaviors. It occurs in older couples just as much as it does in younger couples. But again, that can be something that um, practitioners, we tend to interpret 
the evidence in front of us through the way we're looking at things. And it can sometimes people can sort of miss miss out on that or even think, no, um, I'm not going to ask that, uh, ask about th uh, that and sort of sidestep it. Um, and again, these relationships can be quite complex in that um, you can have an older couple where um, one, one person has got a, um, a greater level of um, disabilities, but in a sense, the two are kind of looking after each other. So it can be sometimes hard to distinguish who is the carer and who is the service user. Um, and sometimes the designations can be quite arbitrary. Um, the other area, which I'm not really going to touch on to explore much today, but I need to mention it because it is there, is in um, adolescent parent violence and abuse. And this has been, uh, is, it ha um, in 2015, the Department of, um, of um, Education did release some guidance on, um, um, on this topic for social workers. But a research has shown that, again, it's something that doesn't really fit in children and family social work in the kind of child protection paradigm because what happens if the child is actually the main threat to the parents? Um, what happens if the child is engaged in uh, uh, um, criminal behavior or is showing violence or aggression towards their parents? And um, this, is, this is another area of basically where carers can um, encounter harm from the people that they care from. But really what I'm going to look at is today is mostly adult service users and um, how do we safeguard uh, the family carers, adult carers of, ad of adults who need care and support. So. Greg, there's a, there's a message in the chat box, a question. Oh, Greg, Let's take you. it now. Yes, please. Let's take them as we go along. Okay. So, um, Somebody has typed, is it not also due to the power imbalance between the service user and the carer due to who has the control of his, over the service user's care needs, environment, finance, etc.? And what has been the relationship between the two? That's a great question, Scaria. Thank you for that. Um, it actually, my answer is going to be one of those uh, answers that I, I'm sure uh, people hate from academics, but it, it's complicated. And the reason it's complicated is like, um, is quite often we can think of power as a binary. We can think the carer has the power, the service user is the person who needs, who needs the support. The carer could then therefore abuse their position, either intentionally or unintentionally. But actually in human relationships, power shifts, it shifts over time. Uh, is often, it's often relational. Um, for example, if you have a, a, a couple um, and perhaps an older couple, perhaps where the, um, the male partner has developed dementia, um, his, um, let's say his wife is looking at, after him. In some ways you could think, well, she's got more power, but again, people can often feel that like, if, if she spent her whole life kind of meeting his care needs, and his needs become increasingly demanding, it can, it, you know, how to an outsider it might feel like, well, she's got her full mental fac faculty, she can make, she's got choice and control here in a way that he doesn't. But sometimes that is not apparent to the participants, yeah, uh, or sorry, to the, to, to the people in, in this situation. And it does shift. Um, it shifts depending on who, who else is involved in, in the family network, in the professional network. Um, it's, and, and according to those people's perceptions as well, um, whose accounts are being taken taking more, more seriously? Um, I can see another question. I actually do have access to the chats, which is great. Um, so I don't, um, Scary, I don't know if that answered your question, um, but I think, but um, what I'm trying to suggest here is that sometimes the line between carer and person needing support. It's something that's formalized in the way we do assessments, but in the way people actually live their lives, it can be a bit, it can be a bit more complicated. And especially for the participants, it can be more complicated, which sometimes makes it difficult for them to explain what what's going on to the social worker. Yeah, because the social, 
as social workers, we come with those, those forms, those concepts, and we kind of tend to use that as a way of filtering the reality and the accounts that people are, are giving us. So there's a question here from Sabu. Um, whether the carer has the right to raise a safeguarding concern against a vulnerable adult they're looking at, they're, they are looking after. Really interesting question, Sabu. And that's what I'm going to probably, I think it's the next slide. So maybe I should go to the next slide and try and answer it from there. Okay, so this slide is basically to give us an overview of, well, what is the, the situation in law and in guidance? And hopefully, Sabu, this will help answer your question, um, or at least give us a starting point for the discussion. So under the CARE Act 2014, local authorities, we do have a duty to protect informal carers from abuse. However, there's a bit of a snag because the specific duty to make care safeguarding inquiries, which is basically the edifice that we have totally constructed our safeguarding systems on since the CARE Act. I know safeguarding was around since No Secrets, which was, what, 13 years before the CARE Act was the first safeguarding, safeguarding systems were set up. But when they got formalized in the CARE Act, we got given a statutory basis for it. Um, we have section 42, and that says that there's a duty to make inquiries for adults in, in need of care and support. It doesn't say du a duty of um, uh, to make inquiries for adults in need of support, which is how the, how carers are framed. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, in need of support. Support. A carer doesn't need care. They're a person who prov who may need some support in their supporting role. Is kind of how the Care Act imagines uh, people in society. Now that said. I have to say that it actually seems to depend on how a referral is, is understood by the people getting the referral. Because even that example I gave earlier on, um, the older gentleman who was pushed down the stairs by his disabled um, substance addicted son. Yeah. Um, the older gentleman actually didn't, was, you know, totally could manage all his um, uh, activities of daily care and living. Um, now, it's questionable about living with a very volatile son, whether he was safe, but basically, he, he, you know, if there hadn't been this incident, he would not have had a, um, a, an assessment. But very much, it was interpreted, um, well, he's an older man, he's actually in his 70s, uh, he might be fit and able, but he's in his 70s, he's an older man, therefore he's vulnerable, therefore this is a safeguarding investigation. And it became a safeguarding investigation, yeah. Uh, with, with a strategy plan and everything. But, you know, if he had been a younger man um, or younger person or the, the ages had been closer together, you know, I've seen cases where it's, oh, this is not a safeguarding matter. This is a matter that a person can call the police. It's, you know, it's a criminal matter. It's not safeguarding. So the way we, we actually frame groups of people tends to, tends to decide when we activate that section 42. So in some ways, I want to put that to, on, on hold for a moment and say, OK, so maybe we don't always use Section 42 when the carers um, when the carers um, experiencing harm. When, as Sabu said, a carer raises concerns, says there's something going on, um, uh, the person I'm looking after is presenting, is, is, is somehow abusing me in some shape or form, right? Um, even if we don't go down the safeguarding route, we still have a duty of, of well-being. It's a general duty to promote the well-being of informal carers, um, meaning family carers, protecting them from neglect and harm. And we could do that through a carer's assessment. We could build the, 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 the safeguarding um, strategy into the carer's assessment if we decided not to deal with it under, sa under safeguarding. Um, there are general principles that we, um, in the CARE Act. Local authorities have a duty, um, sorry, pardon me, uh, my, the chats are on top of my slides, I need to move them. As, lo our lo as local authority officers, representatives of the local authority, we have a duty um, uh, in regard to a number of principles, including the need to protect, peop uh, to protect people from um, harm. Um, 
The ass assessment and eligibility, local authorities have a duty to assess carers who are in need and support. Um, an eligibility decision, when you're making that eligibility decision, you must consider the well-being of the carer. And if you're considering the well-being of the carer, that means that any incidents of harm, you really need to factor that in. So that includes thinking about protection for the carer from abuse or from neglect. So what we've got here is we've got um, a, slight, um, a slightly unclear kind of syst um, system, as in that safeguarding inquiries doesn't seem to take carers in uh, um, by itself. That said, sometimes people who don't who are really carers do sometimes you know um it's that decision of the person who gets the referral or the safeguarding manager at the time whether to manage something under safeguarding but what i'm the point i'm trying to make here is even if we don't manage it under safeguarding if somebody is experiencing harm in a caring in a care relationship we do have a duty to protect them as a carer um under the general principles of the care act um does that makes sense to people. I'm just checking in the chats. I'm just taking a moment to. Okay. So, um, Ibi Yemi, uh, yes, you've, you're summing it up there well. In terms of safeguarding concern criteria, some cares do not meet the criteria and therefore can be at a disadvantage and therefore could somehow um, slip, slip under the radar that there's real harm going on. Again, it depends on, who, on who's interpreting those criteria because um, uh, the eligibility is about the, ultimately is about the well-being of the carer, yep, um, whether they meet the eligibility criteria. So if their harm is arising from, that they're experiencing is arising from their role as a carer, providing care for another person, if you think that's really having an impact on their well-being, then they are eligible. But obviously that's an argument that needs to be made and needs to be accepted, yeah? So I think you're right that it could disadvantage people. And this is why how we think about it as practitioners is really important. Uh, Rumana is saying, as social workers, we involve family and carers in terms of assessment. Sometimes I find the service user agrees almost 100% with, the, with the, the view of the family carer. How can we identify when there's a line or a step towards controlling as the family relationships work in complex ways? Again, this, uh, this is uh, a really important thing that you, you, you've raised here. I mean, there is practice guidance that says we should interview people separately in whatever way we can manage um, to try and uh, separate out different people's experiences. Um, every carer has a right to their own assessment. I do know, I've been as a practitioner for many years, I do know when the pressure is on, it's often the easiest thing to do is to, you know, meet everybody in one sitting, yeah, and hear them together. Um, and if we do that, we actually, you know, um, we might be missing, we might be missing a trick, we might be missing what's really going on. So, you know, I think probably, uh, a reasonable uh, thing would be to try to commu to have a direct line of communication with each person and find out if they're comfortable to, to do that assessment together, rather than assume, rather than offer, go in there say, we're, we're you know, making the offer, you are having an assessment, we're going to be talking to both of you used together. But even then, I think even if you get people on their own, it can be, it can be really difficult, yeah, um, for people to, um, to voice what's going what what's going on. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, stop sharing for a second um, and quickly check my notes because I think we've got another active activity coming up. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, I want to um, basically explore with, 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 with the participants today, with all, all of you who joined us, some of these issues. And um, what I want to use is a, um, a uh, Viginet case study, yeah, which is actually based, um, I, I cited Isham earlier on, uh, it's based on her work um, uh, on interviewing carers who experienced harm. It's uh, 
based on one of, on the testimonies of, of one of those carers. Um, so what I'm going to do, how I'm going to do this is um, in the chats, I'm going to put a link to, I put the case study on a Google document. And let me send this to everybody. Okay, if you click on that link, hopefully it will open the case study for you. What I'm going to do though, is I'm going to share my screen. It's a quite short case study and I will read it through. But I wanted to share the link because um, we are going to go into um, uh, breakout rooms shortly um, and, and then um, come back and discuss or, or share our, 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 um, the fruits of our discussion. But um, as I said, there's a lot of experience here in this room. So I really wanted to kind of tap into that and give you a chance to sort of um, express your own views um, and, uh, and have a chance to discuss things with your colleagues. So um, let me share my screen. I'll read through the case study together and then we can, from there, um, we can, I'll explain um, how we're going to do the breakout rooms and the feedback. And then after that, we will have a break because by that stage you'll all, I think, deserve one. So um, I'm now jumping around. I can see 23 of you have already found your way to the case study, which is reassuring. Let me share the screen so it's on the main screen of the Zoom. Um, so anybody who's watching this recording later also will know what it is we've been talking about. Um, share screen. And here we go. Okay. So this should be now visible in the Zoom too. Okay, now this is a, a story that's written in the first person. It's written in Sarah's voice, yep. So it's the voice of the carer. And um, I will read it aloud. I think that what people have come to understand is the risk from dementia from the carer, it comes in many forms. It isn't just physical, it's also mental. And obviously the last thing I want at night is that, because you're so anxious, you know, because quite often there have been issues throughout the day and you know that it's building up. So that's obviously the last thing. But I think, you know, the one particular occasion that sticks in my mind is when he literally dragged me out of bed by my legs and dragged me across the floor. I slipped a disc in my back and that's still coming up nearly 12 months in the summer. And that's the legacy I have now because my back is a constant source of pain and I'm trying to get treatment for it, but it's a constant reminder. And um, on that particular night, it was because I said no. So, you know, I've learned my lesson that night, never say no, because otherwise, you know, the frustration will build up and you'll pay for it in another way. So in that respect, it is mental sexual violence. Do you know what I mean? Okay, and that is the, the case study. So I, what we're going to do is I would like you to basically in your groups try and answer two questions, which I'm going to put into the chats now. And we're only going to have 20 minutes, which sounds like a long time now, but actually you will find that once people uh, get over the first round of introductions and uh, get into the flow, that it will actually go really fast. Um, so there's two questions I would like your groups to think about. First question is, uh, what, is what issue or concerns do you identify in Sarah's story? And the second question is, what steps could you, could you take or strategies could you use to protect Sarah from, from further harm? Okay. Now, what I want you to do is um, have a discussion, uh, share your experiences, your thoughts about this, about the case study and also about this, this topic in general. Um, and if you could, it would be handy to have, um, if, you, if you're able to open any form of word processor or somewhere where you could jot down your thoughts, because we're going to use something called Jamboard when you come back, which is a way of basically it's like, a, it's like a screen that you can put sticky notes on it. So if you actually have a little bit of text with your ideas, your responses, then you'll find that you can 
pasted into the Jamboard quite quickly. But um, we'll, uh, I'll go over that again when we finish the, um, when we've done with the breakout rooms, yeah? So um, you've got the link to, to the case study. You've got the two questions. What issues or concerns did you identify in Sarah's story? And what steps could you take or strategies would you use to protect Sarah from further harm? Now, obviously it's quite a limited case study, so you kind of need to use, based on your experience, you know, what you think could be uh, some of the responses. So, um, Caroline, you're asking the chat, do I need to save the Word document? If you've made some notes, it's up to you whether you save it or not, but just have them handy because you may want to cut and paste from them. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share another link. And this link is to something which are, you see on the screen at the moment, it's called a Jamboard. Oh. Because I couldn't paste it, it's come out as am board, but it's a jam board. And um, if you click on that link, yeah, I see one person has arrived as an anonymous bear, there's a lizard, there's a fox, there's a narwhal, lots of creatures are arriving. Okay, so I will explain, because I'm sharing my screen, how this works, yeah. If you um, look on the to the left hand side of the screen, you see there's a number of different icons. And the icon we're looking for is the one that says sticky note. The little square with the lines on it, it's a sticky note. When I click on that, um, oh, I wish I'd prepared some text. If you guys have got some text, uh, you'll, f you'll find you can just paste it straight in. Look, that's the Jamboard link. Um, oh, somebody's already gone there, they've gone high. Basically, I click save and it appears there and you can add another one or you can cancel and you can move them around i'm going to delete that because i just did that to show the principle somebody else is moving me around <laughs> this is where all the really tidy people are going to show out themselves like sort of by tidying up so basically the question here what we want to add, what we want to share is what issues or concerns did you identify in sarah's story so if you click on the little um sticky note at the side that will allow you to, um, to write, to paste or write, you can write it out freestyle. What were the issues or concerns you identified in Sarah's story? And then you click save and it will appear on the Jamboard and everybody can see it then. Okay. And the first person, anonymous elephant has found it. Right. Great. So I'll just give people a few minutes to to share. Sorry, I can't seem to get the sticky note to work. Okay, no worries. Um, again, it's the... Yeah, I'm clicking on it and nothing's happening. Nothing's happening for you. Oh dear. No. Okay, if you like, um, you could perhaps put uh, what you want to write into the chats and I could do it for you. you okay. It. Yeah. All right. Oh, Sorry about technology. That. Yeah. I'm going to just cut and paste concerns issues. But I, if people can use the um, the Jamboard, please do, because there's a lot of things to copy from the... I, I don't want to end up in a situation where basically we're copying lots and lots of things from the chats. Um, so, okay. And Yasmin, the links haven't worked for you. So again, if... To, if you want to participate, please, okay, do add it into the chats and I'll transfer it. I can manage, I think, to do that for a couple of people. Oh, can I? And again, sometimes these things will paste over each other. So um, if you click on them, you can move them around the board. Yeah, I can see we've got some things have built up. So I've got some helpers here. So folks are moving things around for me, which is great. Um, particularly any of my helpers, um, pay attention to the top line because that's mo where things are most likely to be sitting on top of each other. And so we're not seeing all the cards that people have put on the table.
This is great. Lots and lots of quite detailed responses from people here. Oh, that one. Sorry, I pasted that from the chats, but I think I might have to read it from the chats uh, because it's uh, it doesn't fit in. That was a contribution from. I can scroll back down from the chats. That was from Dallard. Thank you, Dallard. I'll come to that um, separately. Okay, so we've got a lot, to, a lot to work through here. Um, let's uh, begin um, to talk about it again. Um, uh, uh, I think, um, yeah, I think maybe I should read out some of the main, the main things that people have identified. Um, we've got. Um, Physical violence, sexual violence, fear, lack of time to seek help, emotional abuse, feeling of hopelessness, and to give an example, I learned not to say no, a lack of ch options of choice, anxiety, stress, DV. Sexual abuse has come across, multiple people have picked up on that part of the, uh, of the story, um, which is, you know, one of the shocking parts of the story, I guess. Um, uh, loss of voice, maybe embarrassed with no support network. Uh, potentially life-threatening situation, potentially barriers around her beliefs, around her obligations to her partner, if it was her partner. Guilt, feelings of helplessness and fearlessness, uh, uh, fearfulness, pardon me. So, uh, um, blaming herself. I think this is a thing a lot of people have picked up on that it's, it's, it's kind of, it's really quite difficult for people to talk about these things. There can be a, a big sense of guilt. Um, uh, there can be a lot of conflict for the person um, because they're talking about their loved one. Yeah. And even though they may be experiencing harm and pain from that person, there still can be a very strong Emotion, emo, emotional bond, um, which is one of the barriers that can come up, I think, for um, uh, for carers to talk about these issues with with with, um, with professionals or with, even with other family members. Even um, we've got oh, there's seven new messages, so I'm just going to tune into what's happening in the chats um, from Dallard. We've got two sets of concerns, potentially a life-threatening si tre tre situation, potentially barriers around her, belie her beliefs, around her obligations to her partner, which I think is something that's come up for several people. Uh, guilt, feelings of helplessness and fearfulness. Um, potential, lack of, uh, potential isolation, lack of support, issues building up, this sense of real tension, which I think, you know, uh, has, a, has, a, has a big impact on people over time, living with that kind of level of stress, triggers throughout the day, apprehension, lack of her own identity. In the Viginet, she only speaks of herself as being the, as a carer, as a partner. Um, right, uh, we've got... Okay, there's some interesting things happening in the chats. Um, Sir Sabu is pointing out that he, the um, the uh, uh, partner, husband, um, he doesn't know know he has dementia. 
Um, he wanted to have sex with her and that was his ultimate aim. That's an interesting point, Sabu, in that, again, it, it's about um, our understanding of people's intention. And quite often we ascribe cul culpability, responsibility to people according to uh, their intention. Um, and that's something I want to come back to, but I think there's, again, it's, you know, the pattern of, of I don't know, the sense of entitlement in that relationship. Um, uh, whether he, um, he doesn't consider her needs. Quite often, one of the things that's come out in research is that quite often where um, uh, in later life, where partners care, uh, where a, a couple, in a couple, a part, one partner's caring for the other, Patterns of violence or patterns of other forms of abuse, emotional abuse, um, controlling behavior, they were there before um, the illness or before the disability. Quite often it can be a continuation or resurfacing of behaviors that were there when the person had um, full capacity. Um, and it's very easy for us as practitioners to fall into talking, to talking about the harm in terms of, does the care, has the carer got a proper understanding of dementia? Does she, um, does she need special training? Is it something that she does that's triggering him? And um, in a way that's coming from a good place, what we're trying to do there is find out what's causing this situation and what can we do to somehow like um, uh, avoid those triggers, avoid, avoid instances of uh, like this happening again. But we, it's also can be subtly that we end up shifting our focus away from the harm that's happening and onto the carer's behavior. And if she didn't do this or if she did do that, maybe things wouldn't be so bad. But I'm not pausing to actually acknowledge there's, there's some quite serious things going on here. Um, okay, Kathleen is saying, is, I guess, Kathleen, you're thinking about the role, um, which in this very brief uh, first person advice case study, um, uh, you're asking, could it be her father that's, abu um, that's ab abusing her? It could be. Sarah could be a daughter rather than a partner. Um, the case study, as it was presented, was uh, by, is based on real research, but the, deliberately it's been stripped of... Um, of its, of its wider context, yeah. So it literally comes across as the, a person's first, first vice. Uh, uh, Liepeb, pardon me if I pronounced your name incorrectly. Uh, Liepeb, no clear guidance on how to work with people who are experiencing sexual abuse from people who have dementia. This is, this is, this, this is an important point you're making. Um, there is an increasing body of research around this, yeah, um, of sexually disinhibited behavior or patterns of abuse that may have um, existed before the onset of dementia, but then them, re um, them coming to the fore um, again when the person um, uh, ha has a cognitive impairment. Um, there is, um, you know, res res you know, some thinking going on about this, but there is no clear government guidance. And in fact, as I said, the guidance we have around safeguarding doesn't even include carers. Yeah. Um, uh, but I mean, but basically what we're looking at here is, you know, what could we be trying to do to, um, to support Sarah, to increase Sarah's well-being, to change the situation. It's a very stark situation we're confronted with in this, in, in this case study. Um, there's cultural pressure, and again, um, sorry, this is from the chats. This is something that is, uh, we are all conditioned to have expectations around relationships, including our caring relationships and our responsibilities. This is where when people mention guilt, it comes in, yeah. Um, we, um, you know, uh, we can have a, a sense of being motivated by feelings of love, but also feelings of duty and expectations that this is our role. And sometimes abusive situations for carers can become normalized because they think this is part of the caring. Yeah, this is part of 
the experience. Uh, this is somehow my destiny, yeah? Um, and um, I just have to kind of somehow like soldier on and bear it. That is an incredible burden on people. And, um, and also it can leave the, you know, the question for us as people who are trying to promote the well-being of people in the community is, you know, you know, is it right that people should have to sustain that? Is, is it sustainable? Um, in research that's been done with practitioners, what often comes up is, is um, uh, practitioners feel like uh, they need to kind of uh, help the carer keep going as long as they can. Um, but they don't have a lot that they can offer the carer in, apart from perhaps taking the care for a person, the person with dementia or whatever form of disability, but who's, who's um, abusing the care, taking that person, removing that person from the home. And maybe that's something the carer doesn't, doesn't want. But I'm just thinking about, is Sarah prepared to go to the police? Uh, he may be aware of what he's doing. Um, it's a really good question you're asking here, Mamta. I also think, um, you know, my experience of uh, either people, criminal behavior by people with uh, cognitive um, impairments or um, where people with cognitive impairments, learning disabilities or dementia have, become, have been the victims of crime, it is incredibly difficult, even when there's evidence, clear evidence, to get the police to um, actually become involved. Because often the police, basically, the time and time again, feedback I often get is things like, it's not going to stand up in court. So there's really no interest in following this thing through. Um, and again, you're asking the question, then if he lacks uh, insight, if he lacks capacity, He's, is he criminal li libel? Um, probably not. So sometimes we need to be um, thinking about, you know, what what can be done, what um, what kind of support do people need? What can be done to um, keep the person safe? Um, obviously, we need to make safeguarding personal. Whether we're dealing with this under uh, the safeguarding procedures, or we're dealing with this under um, carers assessment, we really need to we would need to be talking to Sarah, helping her to understand her choices and thinking about what, um, what those options might be and giving her some agency, some, some element of choice and control in, in what happens. Um, returning to the screen, um, this, this question that I've been focusing on the chats there, but returning to the screen, this comes up, uh, does Sarah have capacity does Sarah's partner have capacity in respect of his behavior towards her? Um, and again, as somebody pointed out, it could be that uh, Sarah is the daughter rather than the partner. Um, we all go to our assumptions and I must fess up here, I am assumed partner, but I think it's a valid point. It could be a different kind of relationship. But the question that's been raised here, do they have capacity? You know, and it's an interesting question, but I'm gonna answer it as an <laughs> academic with another question to you, whether they have capacity or not, does, um, is that going to change the dynamic? Because in some ways, whether a person has capacity or doesn't have the capacity, the harm is still happening. Um, and again, this is, this is very much where, I guess for many of us, it's quite important what was people's intentions is the harm accidental or is the harm intentional? Um, and sometimes we're more likely to accept or tolerate harm if we think it's, it's unintentional, I wonder. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, I, can't, I don't know your first name, S. Trotman. Thank you for pointing out in London procedures, carers and safeguarding where abuse is intentional, safeguarding under section 42 should be considered. But again, it's uh, what this guidance is actually for, foregrounding is the intentionality. If it was intentional or it wasn't intentional, the impact, the harm to Sarah would be still the same.
Um, so if it could, if it's not intentional, um, it wouldn't come under that guidance. It wouldn't be section 42, but you still have, we, I, this is a question. Do we still have an ethical responsibility? Okay, S. Trotman's come back with a, a quite unequivocal yes. I'm also hearing that my internet's not great. Um, so please, if, you, if it's not clear, you need me to repeat, please do. I'm hearing a lot of yeses. Okay, so again, you, as practitioners, in a way, it'll be your decision in consultation with your supervisors, with your man, uh, line managers, how you handle a case. You may choose to handle it under safeguarding procedures. You may, may choose to handle it under some form of cares assessment, because you could argue that Sarah's well-being is definitely at, in jeopardy here. Yeah, I think that's kind of uncontroversial. And basically the well-being if the, need, if, the, if the carer's need for support arises from them caring for a person and it's impacting significantly on their well-being, then they're eligible for your involvement. Then they're eligible for a service. Then they're eligible for some support, some work around what can be done to, um, to address this situation. Um, and yes, I would very much agree with the people in the chats who are saying, yes, we do, whatever, whatever, whatever procedure it falls under, we do have a responsibility. I'm going to try and wrap up and I'm probably not going to do justice to all the, the really um, brilliant things people have put on here. Um, uh, because, you know, there's some really important questions like in, it's in, in, in terms of incidents of physical harm at long lasting effects. Was this the first time? And again, this is where, you know, the question about what is the life history or trajectory of the people you're working with? You know, is this something that has been perhaps going on for decades? Um, there's a question here from uh, uh, if the if the care was at risk of being harmed in other ways. Would could be life threatening. Would the person with dementia be taken so lightly? Mm. Good question. Again, this is where our subjectivity and also our, our ethical responsibility kind of comes into play. Uh, these are the questions that we need to ask ourselves as practitioners. And sometimes we're not going to find easy answers. Um, Namta's talking about the Mental Health Act, which, yes, I guess that could be invoked in that um, uh, uh, a person with dementia might come under the Mental Health Act. This case study was about a person with dementia. These kind of patterns of abuse uh, can occur with many caring relationships. Yeah. Um, and again, dementia, uh, dementia, the, the Care Act, what it would do would be, would be is um, uh, um the um let's say the partner just for argument's sake the partner could be removed um to a place of safety to a hospital for assessment and then treatment which would probably be some form of uh medication to see if that could alter his behavior now the thing is quite often these things are situational um in that um in my own experience um where um a person with dementia was you know, quite aggressive towards uh, his, again, his male gendered, his female partner. Um, the, the behavior tended to happen when they were alone at home, when he was at day center, when he was interacting with other people, when um, it was crazy, it was nearly like a, a survival instinct would kick in that if somebody he perceived to be an authority, whether that was a social worker or a doctor was speaking to him, he was meek and mild as a lamb. Yeah. Um, and it made it very difficult to see that, uh, you know, um, basically this, uh, um, the mental uh, 
Health Act would only apply if you were removing a person to safety for assessment and then for treatment, and then they'd be re-released into the community, whatever that was. Um, I guess what I'm saying here is that like, um, one, it can be very difficult for people to detect for outsiders, whether that's a mental health professional or that to actually, you know, get the evidence about the person, the person's risk. Um, two, the treatment, I mean, you know, you only take a person who goes into hospital if there's going to be something that they can be treated with. Sometimes, so we end up in this situation is, you know, um, with the care, do we remove the person? Uh, and this is the dilemma, or do we try and change things in the situation? The answer is going to be different in every case. And this is where your ethical reasoning and where talking about this with other people um, uh, uh, within the team. Um, and um, so you've got different perspectives and you can check out your own thinking is really important. Um, I want to move to the next screen, which is actually thinking, and I guess we've already got into that conversation, but let's, for the record, the second question, which was, um, uh, what steps could you take or strategies could you use to protect Sarah from harm? And again, if you have some ideas, please do. Okay, great. People are already having ideas. So I'll give a few minutes for people to perhaps populate the board um, so we can all kind of see what we're bringing to the table. And while you're doing that, I'm going to just scroll a little bit back because I see that somebody, uh, um, there's some kind of comments in the chat and I missed it. So I want to. Okay, it's from Sabrina. This is why it's so important to signpost to other agencies that can support with dementia and have an understanding, as this could make all the difference to a, an informal care, a support network. Indeed, I think that's a, re that's a really important suggestion, suggestion Sabrina. Um, people are saying, speak with Sarah. And I think that kind of harks back to what we're saying about um, in these situations, trying to give some choice, some control to Sarah and um, knowing that it's not always, sometimes there isn't really simple solutions, but at the same time, that doesn't mean we can kind of like, just sort of sit back and say, well, you know, um, kind of like look the other, look, look the other way. So, Mm hmm. I think there's some really good suggestions beginning to pop up on the board. Okay, Caroline, your sticky notes are not working. I hear that. So, you know, please do put something in the chat so I will look out. Um, uh, Ibi Yemi, I'm not sure if this is something that you've put into on, onto the board. Let me double check. Get it, get dementia intensive support involved. Offer respite and work with the family. Jay Clark, sticky notes are not working for you either. So, you know, please do free, feel free to pitch into the chats as well. Okay, Caroline, thank you for that. I'm going to see if I can, if I can paste your ideas into a sticky note. I don't know if it'll work, but let's give it a go. I think it kind of worked. <laughs> it's a little bit long, but it worked. Thank you. 
Oops. Okay. Some great ideas here. Training for the care to understand the behavior and tackle the approach. There have been various ideas around counsel um, from peer support to uh, to uh, specialist talking therapy or counseling, psychological support. Training around dementia for Sarah. Find a way to speak with Sarah on her own, find out about her experiences and the history nature of her relationship with this person. I think that is really important. Uh, giving a person a chance to narrate their story, to understand what it is that's going on for her. Um, because in some ways, the ideas about training around dementia are really good ideas. Um, and thank you for people who put those in. But in some ways, we need to kind of start with the person who is experiencing the harm yeah um and we have to be careful that i think that we don't jump too quick to you know ah this is really terrible story um there's a care support group maybe you can go there and it'll be all right without kind of giving that space or you um to sarah to think about what is the harm that's been experienced here i mean a panic button might be the right thing. It might be the right thing. Um, uh, having uh, um, having separate rooms might be the right thing, or that might actually make things worse. Again, it, it, it's going to be like, you know, trying to, uh, doing a kind of risk assessment, trying different strategies and reviewing those strategies because what, may initially seem like a good idea to the practitioner uh, or to Sarah, may not actually, when you actually try to try it in practice, it may, there may be unintended things happen. It may, it may, it, it may cause um, other, um, other things. So, you know, I think sort of making the process, whether it's done under, under safeguarding, whether it's done under a CARES assessment, making it personal, to Sarah, I think is really key. Um, and all these wonderful ideas, um, and they are wonderful, um, you know, are all kind of possible things to check. Um, uh, they may become part of the, the plan and they should definitely be part of the strategy discussions. Um, there's empowering Sarah with information resources available to dementia, carers, support, domestic violence, also carer assessments to both Sarah as a carer and the person she's assess as caring for, and perhaps a mental health assessment. Um, training for the carer to understand the behavior and tackle the approach. Yes. Uh, medical review, respite, referral to mental health team for behavior, behavior management. Get health involved because of the behavior. Um, Again, I think it's very important to hear Sarah's voice. Um, and it, I'm not saying that this is what would happen, but there can be a tendency that we kind of get carried away with the, um, uh, with, you know, putting the focus on like, we need to train Sarah and maybe that will work. But if we, all the conversations about Sarah's training, we can sometimes lose the focus about the partner or the person she's caring for's behavior. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that that, that, that that would necessarily happen, but it's something to be kind of think about. I'm really liking this one that says contingency planning. If, if at risk access support in, a, in an emergency, a neighbor, that kind of what to do in the moment, uh, that kind of conversation is really, really, uh, could be really productive. Um, conversation. Um, Rose, you've added some things in the chats uh, to try to understand the couple's past and culture, why the partner may be feeling this way, or, you know, maybe that's a really interesting point, Rose. I don't know if we'll, if we, especially if somebody's with dementia is advanced, it can be really difficult for us, especially coming as outsiders, to understand what is the motivation, whether the person intends to do it or not is kind of separate, then there's a motivation to act in this way. But 
you know, it can be that there's there's been a previous history here, and it can be that um, uh, uh, helping Sarah to talk about, or giving Sarah the opportunity to talk about that history may give her some insights and may give you some insights for how 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 maybe it's possible to uh, to to manage the situation. And then also there's the question is, is this a situation that Sarah wants to manage? What choices are we offering Sarah? Um, those choices may be limited by what's uh, available locally. So um, there's a lot going on here. Um, what I want to do is um, I think I'm going to keep sharing, but if anybody wants to raise a hand to come to come in, um, I think um, could I ask the co-host because we've got a couple more minutes before we go to um, we need to go to the break, uh, but we will go to a break. Um, but I just in case and um, I don't know anybody has something to say, either a, um, an observation or a question. Um, perhaps you could raise hands, but I would ask my co-host to look out for that because I can't see them with my screen sharing going on here. Okay, from where I am, I hear, um, I'm hearing silence, so I think this is okay. Yeah. Um, yes. Oh, sorry, I can't see you. So sorry for speaking all of you. Yeah, there's just one thing in the chat that says could consider Marac once conversations have been had with Sarah. There's nothing about. Hmm. Interesting, because Marac is a police-led process. Yeah. Um, but it can be a really useful forum for getting different people around the, the around the table. Um, and I'm also. That's got me thinking because it, it ties in with Ibi, Ibi, Ibi Yemi's uh, comment. Uh, discuss with Sarah the need to get the police involved around the sexual abuse. Um, I think that could be Sarah's choice. She may not want to make that choice. Also, it can be very, very difficult, uh, as I said, um, getting police to act because the way police tend to look at things um, and I hope I'm not doing them an injustice but often it's about like can they get a conviction yeah and in cases where they can't get a conviction they kind of in my own experience from working in cases like this they kind of put it back on the social worker this is a social problem can't you do something about it um, because this won't this is not going to lead to a conviction because there's questions about capacity for one of the parties involved, yeah. And I've had, I don't know if that resonates with other people's experience, if you've had experiences like that. Um, Hi, but Greg, I, it's Mamta. Mamta. Uh, okay. Yeah, I fully agree with you. These are not straightforward cases where um, you involve police, uh, like any other case where customer might have capacity. So often these cases end up uh, inconclusive and there, is, there will be a history of safeguarding concerns raised by police when they will attend if in case um, care like Sarah will call police but they won't take any action and um, then you end up with if, if customer lacking capacity thinking about less restrictive option and all that so mm. again it, it, it's considering all the options before taking any now that is not to say, so, sorry ma'am, because I can't see, uh, I, I may have inadvertently cut in at the wrong moment, but I was going to say that is not to say that like the police may not be an option, yeah? No, um, no, definitely not, no, they should be. It's something we need to talk through with Sarah or with whoever it is that we're, you know, di um, working with in this situation. Um, again, uh, it wouldn't be about putting Sarah off, but you know, um, uh, and maybe and maybe that conversation might be useful and maybe there's things around community policing things like panic alarm mm -hmm. things that could be they could have a very useful uh, uh, input into the situ in, in, into, into the situation yeah 
Yes, but I agree that no, it will I... always come back to social worker that yes, police has been attending, but personal lack capacity, nothing they can do. Carer is not happy to report it to the police. So social work services should do something. They should put safeguard in place. Often, I'm I'm saying in most of the cases, this is the scenario where we are putting safeguarding in place, and at the end, then this person person will end up in a care home, which is not the less restrictive option as well. I have a different view, Greg. Thank can you, I sir. share? Can I share mine? Um, like historically, I think that the police probably wouldn't do anything. But I think since safeguarding's, you know, firmly embedded in statute and it's part of Care Act, I've in my previous practice experiences, I feel that the police officers that I have worked with are far more um, aware of capacity issues and they do investigate. It doesn't mean that the outcome of the investigation leads to a, um, a conviction, but they will investigate. Um, and I would say my experience in the last five, six years is the police have been incredibly helpful mm. and have worked, um, have worked together sort of um, and been quite proactive in attending safeguard and planning meetings um, and giving advice and information. Certainly one of the local authorities that I worked with, we had quite a good relationship with um, our police officer in MASH, um, who would give lots of advice and information. And he knew what he knew the safeguarding team really, really well. So um, so I think it depends where you work. Um, I wouldn't like to say that, no, they never help, and that's like a blanket approach. Um, and again, I think uh, the point that you made about it, it may not lead to a conviction, but the, their involvement may lead to some, to some really useful strategies. In terms of risk management and, yeah. and, and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and one thing I just wanted to put into the pot too is like, um, um, people have suggested Marek, and Marek is a way of coordinating different um, different, different wor uh, workers. But there's other approaches too that can be useful, perhaps not in this particular case study, but where we're dealing with the dynamic of harm towards carers. Um, one of the suggestions um, has been around um, using adult family case, uh, case um, co uh, family conferences. Um, and um, yes, yeah, Scurry, I see you want to come in. Perhaps we'll take your point, and then I guess I did promise you guys a break, so I should okay. give you a break. Um, thanks, Greg. Thank you for this. Um, I think one aspect we need to uh, keep in mind is, uh, as we are discussing it within the safeguarding uh, uh, framework, uh, we need to uh, see here the person at risk is Sarah herself, as opposed to her. Uh, the other person who has got a diagnosis of dementia. Of course, capacity is a bigger issue there. But having said that, uh, any safeguarding, any action that we do within the safeguarding intervention or Section 42 pathway is, is about under the principle of making safeguarding personal. In this case, we would definitely ask Sarah, what does she want to see happen to her and to the person who harmed her? And including police intervention, as the speaker earlier said, uh, police will need to be involved. They would do their own investigation, but it would not result in any uh, conviction for that matter, probably because he's a vulnerable adult, but probably because he doesn't have capacity around uh, the harm he has done. But of course, this has to be led by Sarah herself. She has got capacity. See, she's the person who was at risk of harm. She would inform the assessor, the social worker, what needs to happen next, including intervention of police in this matter. So I suppose um, that's how we would uh, how to proceed in this case. Thank you. Thank you for that, scary. Okay, folks, what I'm going to do is um, we're going to have a short break. Originally, I didn't visit 15 minutes, but would a 10 minute break be acceptable? Um, and then we'd come back for the last 20 minutes to uh, uh, to wrap up, yeah. Okay, so let's uh, go for a 10 minute break. I'll stop sharing the screen. And um, so we're going to reconvene at um, at 11 minutes, sorry, um, six minutes past 
uh, uh, for, yeah. Okay, so um, enjoy your break, break, folks, and we'll see you all again shortly, or we'll, re we'll restart shortly. Hello, everybody, and welcome back um, to the final 25 minutes of the session. Um, so I want to start sharing my screen again. And the joys of working home, I've got a rather big cat sitting on my keyboard. I need to remove him. Um, okay. Hey. Oh. Sorry, folks. Um, and just move the chat. Okay, and here we go. These are, the, I've just got five slides that I'd like to share. And again, please, if you wanna make comments in the chats, please do. So I wanna kind of look at some of the barriers to, address, to addressing issues of care or harm. Of, um, it's a topic, it's an, a social phenomenon that can often be hidden in plain sight because of the way we see and understand things. And um, let's, uh, first two slides, I want to look at uh, what research has shown us about practitioners, particularly about social workers' understandings of these situations. So our professional understanding of what constitutes adult protection issues is often framed by the relationship between the perceived characteristics and perspectives of the victims and the perceived identities and the intentions of the perpetrators. So what research has shown is that when we, um, what we consider to be an adult protection issue, a safeguarding issue that we need to act on is often about like who we see as being the, uh, as well as what are the characteristics of the victim? Do we see them as vulnerable? Do they see themselves as vulnerable? And what, what do we see as the identity and the intention of the perpetrator? And this can often work that where the offender is the person who's receiving the care that we sometimes don't see what's going on right in front of us. And often um, Johnson's research with social workers in Scotland has shown that if harm is not seen as intentional, sometimes social workers don't consider it abusive. But that was the question I was asking you to reflect on is if that, whether the harm is intentional or not, perhaps its impact on the person um, subjected to the harm is you know similar or perhaps even worse um, in some cases something to think about how do we frame what we're looking at social workers can focus on how harm is rooted also another thing we can do is social workers can focus on how the harm is rooted in a person's condition or illness and for example in the example we were looking at it's very much about thinking is this something to do with the person's dementia now that can be important, but it can also inadvertently shift the discussion onto the ways that the carer's response may be contributing to the behavior or focusing on the carer's coping. coping. Are they managing the situation um, without actually naming the harms that are experienced by the carer, without actually saying what it is that's actually going on here and naming it, yeah? So it's very easy to sort of elide what's happening by putting all the, emphasis on whether the carer is coping or not coping. And this is what um, Isam Bradbury Jones and Yusin found in their research, which they've just published this year in the British Journal of Social Work. So another thing that influences uh, um, how practitioners see these issues can be our, our views even stereotypes, I could say, our attitudes towards people in older life. Um, when violence is carried out by older people, for example, within an intimate partner relationship, what some people might refer to as domestic, uh, domestic relationship, partners can seek to, ex uh, practitioners, social workers can sometimes seek to explain and contextualize uh, the behavior in a way that's dissimilar from approaches to working with younger people. People find sort of excuses, find ways of sort of saying that somehow it's different than what's happening with younger people. Um, 
and uh, this is research mostly from North America, but with social workers by Crockett et al. 2018. They found out that practitioners' reactions to violence amongst older partners and um, was, was different. There was more of a kind of attitude that, you know, people, they don't have a lot of choice at that stage of their life. And maybe they need to, um, you know, they need to accept that there's difficulties in the relationship and, um, and they don't have a lot of options. And this was quite often different from the way uh, social workers felt the need to advocate for younger service users. Practitioners are sometimes reluctant to ask questions about incidents of violence or abusive behavior towards family carers, especially incidents of sexual violence in relation to older people, assuming that the carer would find it really uncomfortable to talk about such experiences. Now the point, this is from Isam Bradbury Jones and Houston. The point, the point here is, yes, it is a really uncomfortable thing to talk about. Um, it's a really difficult thing to talk about and I'll come to that a little bit more in the next slide, but it's also a really difficult thing to live with. And if we aren't able to address it or to explore it, and we have to be careful how we do that, but if we aren't able to address it or explore it, we're kind of basically leaving that person in that situation and perhaps missing an opportunity to make some kind of positive change. So this kind of takes us to how does the carer think about this, yeah, and what research tells us. Now, there's a lot of variety um, amongst carers, a lot of diversity, but some basic things have kind of patterns have kind of emerged over, over the last 10, 20 years of people looking into, into these sort of situations. Um, some carers may choose to keep silent as they consider the abuse as normal for their situation and they don't describe their experiences in terms of emotional, verbal or financial abuse. They will use, uh, they will say, well, he got angry with me or uh, he's always nagging me or he's very demanding or, but they won't use the word abuse. And in fact, it can be difficult sometimes uh, if, when you if you introduce that type of language, sometimes people will kind of back away and sort of try to recontextualize what's happening in a, in a way that um, doesn't talk about abuse or doesn't cast them into the role of being a victim. So, now, there are reasons for this. There may be bonds of love and affection between the victim and the offender. And this can lead to an ambivalence whether to report or even to discuss the matter with anyone. Carers don't want to get the person they care for into trouble. Yeah. They feel that their role is to protect that person, even if that person is, is in some way causing them harm or suffering. Um, also, there's something about language. Um, carers can be resistant sometimes to identifying with terms such as abuse or victim because they find them too uh, emotive, too simple, too stark, um, and associated with perceptions of intimate partner violence. So, um, it can, if you're talking to a person and you suspect that there may be a, a, a harmful dynamic going on. They may be subjected to harm. If you're talking to a carer, sometimes the best thing is not to say, is, is uh, the person you care for, is X abusive towards you? It's more useful to say, how do they behave towards you? What's going on? What's happening for you? And then later on, um, introduce those terms. But if you introduce them at first, it can set up a barrier. People kind of clam up, people go, uh, I don't want to say that about, about the person I'm caring for, yeah? I find that language, it, that language isn't me. That people are resistant to identifying with that kind of language. So practitioners need to be sensitive to this and to develop nuanced ways of discussing the issues with families. This can help families to disclose and discuss the issue in a more timely and meaningful way. So often it's better to ask what is going on rather than to use words like abuse or are you a victim? straight off with people. You need to give people time to express things in their own words and reflect those words back to them so that they can um, get some kind of perspective on, what, on what's going on. I've talked about practitioner 
attitudes or views that can sometimes be a barrier to address, uh, addressing harm towards carers. I've talked about sometimes uh, carers themselves can put, can put up barriers or be resistant um, or reticent to exploring or to it's disclosing what is going on. Um, but the, you know, all this is happening in a social context, a society that's structured by inequalities. And some researchers have drawn attention to this in their work. Heron and Rosenberg um, suggest that family carers experience a form of structural violence as a result of social practices and institutional structures, including the way we uh, structure the institutions of social care that constrain the carer's ability to talk about aggression. But actually the way we've set up our systems make it very difficult for people to actually talk about this. And now, what do I mean by structural violence? Um, and this is a definition taken from Banerjee and Banerjee was actually looking at uh, inc incidents of violence that happened in care homes and residential homes. And uh, Banerjee descri describes structural violence as is referring to the role that institutions and social practices play in preventing people from meeting their basic needs or realizing their potential. So it's the way that either institutions or practices act to prevent people from meeting their basic needs, from getting their needs addressed, or from realizing their potential, realizing that they've got some kind of choice or are able to exercise some kind of control in the situation. So for carers, this can include both the social workers, our framings of the issues. Our voices are really powerful. How we describe what's going on carries a lot of weight. That is the power of our profession. And if we're framing things as in, it's all about how you're providing the care and sidestepping the issues of the harm, we can be basically acting to unintentionally, but we can be silencing people. But also, as I've shown in the last slide, it can be about wider social attitudes that carers themselves may have internalized. And finally, another limitation can be the restriction on resources through policies of austerity that prevents carers' needs from being recognized or addressed. And an example of the last point is that since 2015, the volume of carers' assessments, the numbers of carers receiving support, and council expenditure on carers and care, care satisfaction have all been decreasing year on year. Now the Care Act was brought in in order to um, enshrine uh, the well-being of people with uh, support needs and their carers. But what we've been happening since since 2015 is the amount of support that's been provided on a formal level to carers has been decreasing year on year on year. Um, so this means that we're operating in quite a difficult context. And it means that more than anything, we need to be mindful about what we're doing, reflect on what we're doing so that we don't inadvertently perpetuate um, the patterns that silence people, that make it really difficult for people to articulate What's, what, what their lived experience is. So this is my final slide. Um, and it's a summing up of what the research suggests may be ways forward. Um, identifying and addressing this problem may be challenging and complex. And we've touched on some of the reasons why, yeah. Um, and it's likely to raise difficult questions about the different rights and needs of family members and how they can be reconciled. So this is where, you know, well, earlier on I was saying there was no magic bullets or instant answers or some of the, the very valid points people are raising. My, I was coming back with, it's a bit complex, yeah? Um, because it can be about the, you're faced with situations where there's conflicting needs of different family members and rights and as a social worker you have both the interest you're trying to look after the well-being of the person receiving the care and the person who's providing the care um, so this is why it, it can be tricky
tricky. And this is why it's really important to get other perspectives, to vo involve other people in the, dis in the discussions, to um, get to involve the people affected, but also, you know, in, in um, coordination with um, uh, partner agencies, with other professionals, with um, other people in your own team, you know, to work through, think through um, how we're approaching things and thinking through how this is going to land with the different stakeholders. Practitioners need to clearly identify the issues and develop plans that address practical issues. And thank, thank you, people, that really did come up in, in the second, in, in, in the second um, uh, Jamboard that we looked at. But we need to um, identify the issues. We need to develop plans that address practical issues and also contingencies. Uh, how do you deal with things in an emergency situation to support carers to keep themselves safe in a risky situation? Reflective supervision, team discussions may be helpful in this in thinking through the issues. And interdisciplinary working can also be helpful. Um, and we've touched on that in some of our discussions today. Um, there has been some research and it's not a lot, a bit, but looking at in some local authorities, um, family group conferences um, have been introduced in adult, prote uh, adult protection um, contexts. And this may be potentially a way forward because similar to Marek, but not police led, more, more led by the uh, practitioner and by the family members themselves. It may offer a practice response that can combine an emphasis on promoting well-being, partnership, partnership with carers, and interdisciplinary approaches to addressing risk, harm, and needs. It can be, it's something that some lo London local authorities have been working on developing. I think in some areas it's, it's um, been around for a number of years now, but it's not something that's uh, widespread or preva prevalent um, everywhere. But, the basic principle of involvement or partnership, I think, is a really useful one um, in terms of uh, supporting us to support people who are, who, who are fa facing these kind of um, issues. And Kathleen, you're absolutely right. It is, it's borrowed from children and families work. It's something that um, is developed in child protection and it's been adapted in some local authorities to looking at issues of to giving a framework for approaching adult protection. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen there, or perhaps I should just say that all the references, everything that has been that has come up, uh, there's a complete left reference list on the slides. I believe this will be shared um, after the session. I've, Oops, I need to stop sharing my screen and so I can see you all again. And um, uh, also I've put the references into a reading list which will also be circulated. So literally we have um, five minutes left. So I guess this is the time if you have any other questions, comments or observations, this is the time I'd invite you to, to um, share. And it could be that I've just worn you out and it's late in the afternoon and a long day. And that is absolutely okay too. And I really thank you for your, for your patience, attention and time. But uh, we have a, just a couple of minutes left. Yeah. Um, Can we get, get a copy of these slides, please? Okay, I think that's a question to pass to maybe Charles or Sandra. Yeah, yeah I can, uh, at the end of the session, Maybe not either this afternoon or maybe tomorrow. I'll send out the slides to everyone who attended today. And just, um, uh, just to let you know, we've got another webinar on the 24th of March, which Greg is delivering, um, which is cultural competency in care of assessments. Um, we've still got lots of space. If you follow the link for the TP website, which I've just put in the chat, you can book yourself a place. 
Um, and for those practitioners that have to record um, any sort of training sessions they attend in their free PD records, please don't forget to do so. Oh, and I've just added into the chat as well. Um, we've got a feedback form, a link to a feedback form on today's session. So we'd really appreciate if everyone could follow that link and give feedback as this helps the partnership with our events moving forward. Yeah, and it, we also feed it back to the workforce and learning and development leads within your respective borough. So it could feed into evaluation, could feed into any future training you can access within your local authorities. Can I just ask, um, how would um, participants of today's session get hold of a copy of the slides? Or is it just through watching again on YouTube? I'll be sending them out later on this week. Oh, you will? Yeah, I'll send the slides out to everyone. Okay. And the YouTube, have we got the link for the YouTube for people or will it be on slides or something of that nature or an email? Yeah, I want to uh, I put that in the chat, the YouTube channel, the link. And I also, when I send out the slides, I'll add the, um, I'll add the website as well as the YouTube channel. So you've got it all. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Very informative. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. And thank you um, to the partnership for giving me this opportunity um, to, um, to share, share this area of interest. And thank you to, for all the responses from people in the chats. Uh, oh, actually, there is just one question. I've just, oh. noticed, I've just got a second. It's from Kathleen. Oh, no, sorry, Carleen. Can I confirm that if a carer does not have care and support needs, it's not a safeguarding but wellbeing plan can be put in place. Sorry. Good question, Caroline. Okay, basically, um, uh, carers' eligibility are all around. First of all, is the person the carer? Uh, it, does their needs arise from providing care from somebody else? Right. Um, so, okay, if people cross that threshold, then it, it's about like, um, is is the um, do their needs for support have a simple have an impact on their well-being so basically what this means is that like if a person is is is, suffer, is suffering harm to the point and whatever form that harm is whatever form of abusive behavior that is whether it's psychological or physical um, or financial if it's having a significant impact on them then they would that they are they are eligible for support now there's a question about so actually this would be a carer support, uh, um, a carer's assessment, a carer's support plan is what you'd be looking at here. Now there are gray areas because quite often, because carers themselves can sometimes uh, need, have um, needs for care, right? In which case they would come under the, the, the safeguarding um, legislation. So it's a bit of a gray area there, but I think the, the takeaway message is that However, we and obviously it's going to be a decision within each team when an instance arises, how you're going to deal with it. Probably got to look at the, um, the situation, decide what's the best way to deal with it. But I think what we probably the takeaway message is that we have an ethical responsibility to acknowledge it and to deal with it. However, we decide to which set of procedures it's best to come under. Yeah. Okay, I hope that answered your question, Caroline. Um, I hope I got the right end of the stick in terms of what you were trying to get at. Thank you. And again, thank you, everybody. Um, and um, yeah, we've come to the end of the session, so it's fine for people <laughs> to leave if you want to leave. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, and then bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Don't forget to fill in the feedback form. Thank you, everyone.